O Flash Camp Brasil é realizado por Adobe e Action Creations. Patrocínio Platinum, Blackberry Playbook. Patrocínio Prata, Velo Telecom. Patrocínio Bronze, Wacom, Influxes, Chambi, Ria Cycle, The Click. Apoio, Jornada Adobe, Tango, Alternativa Platform, O'Reilly, Abra Web, Rádio Jovem Pan, Faculdade Maurício de Nassau, Marca Viva TV, Linda.com. So what, we're, what are we talking about today? So one of the interesting things about Flex is that it provides a very different and powerful way of styling Flash applications. Uh, who here are Flex developers? Got a few? Okay, cool. Uh, who uh, wants to become a Flex developer is interested in that? A few of you? Cool, okay, good, all right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the different ways Flex provides styling. And when I say styling, I'm talking how do we make it look the way our client or product needs to be? Colors, animations, uh, the, the, the user interface and how we integrate that. And so we're gonna focus on that and look about what how it works today and where they're taking it in the future. So Flex 3 has been around for a little bit and there's a, uh, a component set. When I say a component set, that means a button, a combo box, a drop down list. How that was designed by Adobe was called Halo. In Flex 4, they've radically changed that and rebuilt all these components from the ground up using a new architecture, architecture called Spark. And so we're gonna look at the differences between Halo and Spark and how this works together. Now the key thing is that we still have, everything in Flex 3 is still available to us in Flex 4. So it's important to understand how Flex 3 works because we still are gonna be using it and a lot of those methodologies of styling is gonna be important. And then finally we're gonna change, we're gonna really get into how Flex 4 is changing how we design and skin and style these applications. So we'll spend some time getting into that and, and looking at how we actually can take advantage of the new architecture for this. So th the first thing I want to look at is CSS. Uh, who is familiar with CSS? Okay. So for those of you who are not, it's a way of um, styling and defining styles for your application. Now it's not just Flex. CSS is actually in HTML quite a bit. The, the, if you guys do HTML development, CSS is very similar. Um, in how we do it in Flex. So the cool thing about CSS in Flex 3 is that we have the ability to use a syntax to declare how our components and our UI looks. So an example, the very basic one is a button has a color. That's the, the text color of my button. We have a border color. What is the color of the border around it? What is the background color? We can set this through uh, the CSS styling language and that allows us to rapidly change the look of our application without having to go write a lot of code, without having to go into Flash Professional and drawing our own animations or our own layout. Um, and we can do it through CSS. But there are some limitations. One of the challenges that we face with CSS is that we can only change what's provided to us by the component, right? If I want to change, oh, whoa, excuse me, uh, if I want to change how um, the animation, when I roll over my button, I want to fade it in, fade the background, I want to move the text around. I can't do that via CSS because they have not implemented that, Adobe has not implemented that for us. So all of a sudden we come in and hit this limitation of if I need to do something in Flex that's not available to me in CSS, then I have to actually look at other options. So what are my other options? Well, in Flex 3 we have this concept of programmatic skins. Now a programmatic skin is a way of kind of replacing the look and feel of the component with my own programmatic content. So I actually write a bunch of action script to actually do this. So it gives me full control. I can create animations, I can create transitions, um, it, it, the, and it also allows me to um, affect the background of these components. So this is an interesting thing though because it actually does have some limitations. One of the big ones is you have to write a lot of code. If, you, if everyone, anyone have experience with programmatic skins? Okay, a couple of you, it's not easy. Right? It takes time, you have to understand how the component works, and what's even more challenging is if your design changes, your designer comes to you, you need to change the look, you have to go write a whole bunch of code to fix this. So it's very intensive, it's very process uh, heavy, and on top of that, you're only really changing the background. You're really, what happens is 
like in a button, that label is, you can't affect that with a programmatic skin because you're only really changing the background of that component. So there's quite a few limitations. Um, it's powerful, but it spent a lot of time and it was really kind of painful for developers to work with that. So Adobe kind of listened to the development community and realized there has to be a better way. So what they did is they've been improving CSS and Flex4. And so we still have the CSS syntax that we had before, um, but what they're doing is they're really adding a lot more advanced features. And we're going to actually go through all those advanced features in this session, and we'll actually break it all down. And um, one of the nice things, though, is we have this concept of um, that we have this skinning architecture which separates our layout and logic. And we'll go much deeper into that in a bit. Uh, and we can take advantage of that. But one of the core limitations with Flex 4 is that they're not done yet. So what's happened, because they're rebuilding all the components from the ground up, that means they're rebuilding button, they're rebuilding drop-down list, they're rebuilding data grid, that they haven't fully finished all that yet. So what's happening in the current state of, uh, of Flex 4 is a lot of our component CSS styles that we're used to in Flex 3 don't exist in the new Spark components. So I can't, by default, change the border color or change the background color. That makes it much tougher to use CSS. Um, now, they're working on it uh, and making it much better, um, but it's not there quite yet. The big thing about Flex 4 is they've changed this, the way we uh, style our components, though. What they've done now is they've created a new, uh, what they call a replaced programmatic skin with this new MXML-based skinning system. So what that means is that we can rapidly create skins using MXML. So we can, instead of having to go write a bunch of action script and go and code into that, we can now actually create MXML to define how our component looks, how it beh behaves, and that gives us the ability to actually start doing transitions, animations very easily. Um, and it really helps separate a lot of the layout from the logic. So one of the challenges with Flex 3 is that it was all wrapped up into one component. How the button looks and feels is, is also how the button processes your data, handles interactions, how the user interacts with it. So with this new architecture, we now have this concept of a backing component class, which is just solely about managing data and state. And then we have our, our skin, which is responsible for doing all the layout, defining how it looks, defining how the user interacts with it. And so this is really powerful because it also it's no longer just the background. We can manipulate and control everything of that component. And so when we say, you'll see the term parts a lot. I say components, children, parts. Parts, uh, uh, the label of a button is a part. In a video player, the play button is a part. It's an element of the bigger component, right? So we have a video window, pause, uh, volume controls. Those are all parts that make up the video component. And so now we have full control of that, how they look, how they behave, and where we put them using this new skinning system. Uh, the challenge, though, is that we have to actually divide, uh, uh, lay out and def define the skin for every component that we want to create. So unlike CSS, where we could just rapidly drop a whole bunch of components onto the stage and then change how it looks, now we have to spend a little bit more time creating these skins for each component we want to create. Um, also, uh, if you want to support CSS, if you want to actually support CSS in your skin, it requires a lot more work and thought. And we'll talk about that today, about what you need to think about to support CSS in the new skinning architecture. So let's spend a little bit more time talking about this, because th I think that the new architecture is the fundamental change in Flex 4. It's, it's going to really change how we think about development. Um, so really what we're, you know, we have two elements that we need to consider. I, I mentioned before we have the skin, which is an MXML file, and we have our backing component. It's my button. Putting those together allows us to actually change the look and feel of that component. But what's cool about this is that we can change the skin at any time in our application. It's a defined through CSS, a property called skin class. And that means at any time, I can change the look and feel of that component by changing the skin, by simply just calling set style, pass the skin in, new skin gets attached. So it's very powerful. There's a kind of a diagram to how it works. So you have the action script component in the background, you have your MXML, and then the UI is rendered on top of that. And that means we can just change the MXML and change how the, the video player looks and behaves radically. Okay, so CSS support is still there. Um, and we uh, have uh, this concept of some new properties that have been added, right? So they've really pushed theming. Adobe is really pushing themes in Flex. So a theme is the ability to set and change the style of your entire application by just changing one theme file. Um, so they have these new properties, like content, background, color, that are consistent across all the new Spark components so that we can actually create a unique theme and apply that theme across. Um, 
My big thing is like, as I was saying earlier, it's not CSS and Flex4 is not supported in all the Spark components yet, but they're working on it. They're adding more, every release 4.5, the new release is coming out very soon, they've added a lot more CSS properties to the Spark components. So they're trying to encourage and get back to parity about what we're actually uh, comparing Flex3 to Flex4. But the cool thing is, Flex4 has actually significantly more powerful CSS features. And even though we don't have all the CSS support in the existing components, we can really take advantage of these new CSS features when we're actually creating our applications. So I'm going to break down and kind of talk about styling. Let's like talk about what CSS is, let's talk about styling and flex and how I actually use that. So styles are really the ability to change the look and behavior of a component by using a property. So here's a basic example, I have a button, I want to change my text color to red, so we set the color style property to red, right, so we pass the, the value. So that's what we're doing when we talk about CSS and styling, what we're really doing is changing the property saying, hey button, make your text color red, that's styling. So we have four ways of setting styles in CSS. We have the ability to do it through ActionScript. We have the ability to do it through MXML properties. We have the concept of style blocks. And we have the ability to do external style sheets. And I'm gonna, we're going to walk through all four of these and look at the benefits and how they actually work with inside Flex. So the first way we do this is through ActionScript. So this is going to seem pretty familiar for your developers. You have the ability to call a property called set, or a method called set style. You pass the property name that you want to set and the value. And this actually would change, this, similar to the MXML example I showed earlier, we're changing the color of the text to red. So it's, the key thing though is it's not a property on the component, right? We don't do my button dot color. We're using the set style. And the key reason for that is that we actually have in Flex a thing called the Style Manager. The Style Manager's responsibility is for managing all our styles and inheritance and cascading and all these things we're going to talk about a little bit. And to enable that, we have to go through the set style method because what set style does is it tells the Style Manager, hey, I'm changing the style on this component and it keeps track of that for us. So one of the challenges though is because we're making these, these calls and have to deal with the Style Manager, there are some performance hits, there's some performance considerations because we're not just changing the property in that one component, we're telling a manager up, way up high in the, the Flex stack, hey, I'm changing the property and then be, and cascade this and process this throughout the entire uh, um, Flex application. So this, those are some things you need to consider when using styling. So the next thing we, uh, you can do is the property. So we actually kind of looked at this example already. The idea is that we have the ability to set a property on MXML and change the color. Now the key thing here is that you'll notice in the MXML we're not using a method. It looks like a property. Because what happens is MXML is, is uh, processed by the compiler. And the compiler understands that, hey, I'm going to change this from XML into ActionScript. And what it does for us is, is, I know that color is actually not a property, it's a style. So when it gets compiled, it actually turns it into a set style method call for us. So what's really nice is it hides the fact that it's actually a, a different um, methodology of changing the value. We're actually treating it just like a real property. But the, the, the downside of this is that we often forget as developers, we're used to setting these properties in MXML, that that's not really a property on the component. We have to, when we want to interact with it with ActionScript, we're using set style. So just keep that in mind with MXML. Behind the scenes, when the compiler converts it over to ActionScript, it's using the set style methodology. All right, so the third way we can deal with this is style blocks. So now we start getting into the CSS standard and specification of actually setting up styles. So what we have here is we declare the FX style block, and then inside there we can start declaring CSS. So Similar thing, I'm creating a style called my style, I'm setting the color to red, and then I can apply it to my component through a property called style name. And style name, you link back to the style, and that's pretty much saying the same thing, change my button, change this text to red. So now we can start using the new CSS syntax to actually apply this. And what's cool about the CSS syntax is I can actually, in my style, set multiple properties. I don't, not just set in color, I could go set the background color, I could set the uh, uh, content alpha, I can do a whole bunch of different things all in one block and then apply that. I can also change that at runtime. I can actually go in there and change my style name um, from my style to foo style to some other style at any point. So it's starting to give a lot more flexibility, a way of organizing your styles, sharing your styles across your entire application. 
So the final way is an external style sheet. So an external style sheet, you link to a CSS file. The CSS file syntax looks just like the my style of the box, but you don't have to wrap it in the MXML wrapper. And then you can link to it. So this is, you know, if, if you guys do any HTML development, this is going to look really familiar because you're just linking to an external style sheet through the CSS file. And then again, you expose the style name and you can access it and pass it through. So this is a way of really organizing all your styles in one location. And at that point, you can actually share them across your entire application, across your projects. You can create themes and share them across all your products. So it's a, a, a real powerful way of organizing. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. These four ways give us a lot of different ways we can manage our styling systems inside Flex. So the next big thing we want to talk about is when we actually start talking about styling, we need to start talking about what selectors are. Are you guys familiar with selectors and all the different selectors available to you in CSS? Yes, no, sort of. Yeah. OK. Um, so we, we actually in Flex now support four style of syntax. Originally, Flex 3 only supported the first two, type um, and class. And now we actually, in Flex 4, support uh, ID selectors and what we call pseudo selectors. So we're going to look at each of these and talk about when we can use them and how they apply to our, our applications. Uh, pardon me for a moment. I need to uh, get some agua. Talking up here makes you really, really thirsty. Okay. So a type selector. A type selector is the, we want to actually reference a component type. So in this example, I'm saying button, right? I'm actually saying every button in my application, everything that is a button, will have the text color red. So this is a way of globally setting across our entire application some style property. So again, any style property that we want available to us, we can define in here. So this is a way if we, let's say we have an application and our component, uh, our client wants a blue background like my, our logo. We can go in there and set the blue for everything in our application. We can set our text to white. And so it's kind of like a way of theming our enti entire application by using a type selector. So this is the, the topmost selector with the, uh, we, we can use to select anything of any type. And this can be your own custom components. It doesn't have to be button. If you create your own video player, you can say video, my video player. It's anything by the class name. So it's the capital letter of the class syntax, and that's what you're referencing it. So the next thing we have is what's called a class selector. Now this is what really confused me when I first started learning CSS. Because a, a class selector in CSS has nothing to do with components, has nothing to do with uh, access script classes. It's very specific to CSS. So a class selector is kind of a way of grouping my styles and giving it an, a, a, a reference. So you've seen this before, the dot my style. So class selectors always start with the dot and then the name of my class selector. And then anywhere in my application, I can reference it through the syntax style name equals my style. So it's just one way of organizing your content. And then, and then you decide who gets that style at one point versus something like the, the type selector where you're saying everything of this type gets it. So this is the most common, I think, use that most people have used Flex in the past and use CSS. This is typically what you do. You'd actually write a lot of um, class selectors and then use them throughout your application. So one of the new CSS functionalities we have is the concept of ID selectors. So an ID selector allows us to actually define and apply styles based on the component's ID. So you'll notice up here that I have a button with the ID of my button, and then I can use the pound or hash symbol, and then my button, and then that will apply it. So all of a sudden now we have the way to specify very granularly what my button is getting. Right? So we have the new ID syntax, so anything in my application that has that ID will automatically get this style property. So this is really powerful now because we can start really getting down specifically what has what property at what point. And then finally, we have this new syntax called pseudo selectors. So pseudo selectors um, work in combination with our previous selectors. So you use them with type selectors, class selectors, ID selectors. And so what this allows us to do is actually change our CSS based on the component state. So for those of you who are not familiar with a state, uh, the state is something like a button. Uh, a button has four states. It has the over state, the up state, the down state, and the disabled state. 
And so as the user interacts with the button, when the mouse, uh, the moves, mouse moves over the button, the button will enter the over state. We want to make it look differently when the user rolls over it. We want to look, make it look differently when the user clicks down. So now, by using the syntax, we can say on the button up, our color is red, but when the user clicks down, the color becomes green. So you can imagine we can actually do a lot of definition and control of our components using these new pseudo selectors because now we can explicitly say, hey, when you change from state A to state B, I want you to change these styles. I want you to look different. So this gives us a lot more flexibility and a lot more power. Now, for those of you who under, or spent some time with Flex4 states, they've introduced this new concept called state groups. State groups are a way of gr grouping our, our structure. Um, so like, uh, for like a toggle button, for example, a toggle button actually has seven states. It has up, down, over, disabled, up selected, down selected, over selected, and um, disabled selected. So we have to actually manage all those different states in our application. So it becomes really like complex. I don't want to keep defining and redefining the properties over and over again. So they, Adobe's introduced this thing called state groups to help manage this. The problem with state groups is they're not exposed to us in CSS. So if you guys just start playing with state groups, you can't set them through CSS. You have to explicitly set all the different states with the pseudo selectors. So for those of you who understand state groups, keep that in mind. Another big thing they've introduced with Flex4 is namespaces in CSS. So what happens, because they're rebuilding all the components, we now have right out of the box two buttons. We have the Halo MX button and we have the Spark button. So we need a way of declaring which one are we pointing to, right, in our code because the compiler doesn't know. When I say button, which one do you mean? Do you mean the Spark button? Do you mean the, the, the Halo button? And there's no way of mixing, uh, saying I want this to be all buttons, right? So what we end up having to do is this concept of namespaces. So a namespace is kind of like a package. It's a way of like say, saying explicitly which button do I mean to the compiler. So what we do is we have a new syntax in CSS called at namespace. You give it a, what's called a prefix, and then you point to the package. So in this case, it's at namespace s is for our Spark, at namespace space mx is for our mx components, and then you use this new syntax where it's the prefix, the pipe key, and then the name of the component type. So this is specifically for type selectors. You're going to only use this with type selectors because you need to declare specifically a class that I'm referencing. So it's something that's very con uh, confusing when we start working with CSS is that we have to make sure we declare this. So it's important you have to have namespaces defined. You can't just say button and assume that everything gets it. Flex doesn't support that right now. You have to actually use your namespaces. Now the nice thing about Fla uh, Flash Builder is that it supports this for you automatically. If I create a new CSS file on Flash Builder, it would automatically inject our namespaces in there for me. So often you don't have to remember it. And also when you start typing component references, it class hints for us and would actually show us uh, what namespaces are available to us and generate for us. So it's, it's a nice feature of Flash Builder that it helps you minimize and having to think about namespaces. Okay. So the next thing we want to look at is this concept of chaining selectors. So you can see here, by using the comma between this, I can share properties of my CSS across multiple types. So I have a type selector for button, I have a blue text class selector, and I have an ID selector called my label. And then they're separated by commas in a space, and then I can share that property. So this is a way of grouping it together, saying that I want all of these things to have blue text. Instead of having to declare S button color blue, blue text color blue, my label color blue, I can put them together using commas now. So it's really nice because it allows us to actually write less code and share those styles across the application. And we call that chaining selectors. We also have a new concept called dependent selectors. So dependent selectors are the ability to say, when I, my component is, uh, I have a child, so I have a, an H group, which is a container, and it has a child of a button type, I want that button color to be green, or sorry, blue. So what this allows us to do is you can see that it, it, it specifies that. So only when a button is a, a child of an H group will that style get applied. And the way you do this is it's selector, space, selector, no comma, just that. And that, you can chain this as deep as you need. It could be H group to V group to um, canvas to a button. So you can imagine the depth chaining you can do that to determine in your layout, what styles get it and when they get applied. And so this is an interesting way of actually managing those. And you can actually chain this up with uh, pseudo selectors too. So I could do H group, S button, S button up, right? So I could actually define my pseudo selectors and, and create that functionality 
when I'm doing actually my layout. So again, we're really, what Flex is really trying to do is give you much more granular control about when your styles get applied in your application. And one of the most interesting things we learned is that we have this concept of actually linking selectors. So I can, with, if you notice, there's no space between this. So now I'm saying I want a button with an ID of my button with the style class selector label text and make that color blue. So you can see here only this situation would actually come true. So it really gives us, when we put no spaces between it, you can really get down and specify exactly in your application when a style will get applied. Now, of course, you probably wouldn't want to go to that depth. I mean, that's about as deep as you can go. But I just want to show you that you can actually, without using space, you have the ability to actually specify and say, all these things have to be true before the style is applied. So it gives us a lot more control, way more control than we've ever had before in our Flex applications when it comes to styling. So let's spend a little time talking more about what cascading is and how it actually works inside Flex. So cascading is the C in CSS. So cas CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And what this is really about is the ability to define styles and then have children have those styles, and those children get those styles, and those children get the styles. So it cascades down the parent-child relationship. So how does this work? We have three style types that are fine uh, within the, the engine. We have what's called an inheritable style. So if my parent has that style applied, I get that style. If I have children, they get that style. So it inherits down the chain. We have non-inheriting styles. Those say that if I have that style and it's not inheriting, my children won't get that style. So like, um, an example, of that, we're going back to color. Color is inheriting. If I have color blue, my children's color will be blue. But I could make another style, like, um, you know, let's say border background, right? Border background, if I have it set and it's non-inheriting, my children, if they have a border background, they won't get that style applied. So it stops at me. It doesn't go down. So that's important to understand what is inheritable and what is not, because that will define where you set your CSS and who gets it in the parent-child relationship. And then the final type is a global style. A global style, we use a special keyword called global, so it's global curly bracket, and that says everything, no matter what you are, gets this property. So it's a way of sweet, I can set the color to white for everything in my entire application using the global, and it gets globally applied, so yeah, global. So we need to understand, though, the chain of command, because who overrides what, right? Because if I set a color in global to blue, and then later I set my my uh, class selector to red, who's going to win, right, when I apply that to my component? So understanding the order of operations is really important. So global is the highest one, and then type will always override a global. So a type selector will always override anything that's set in global. A class selector will always override anything in a type selector. An ID will override class. A local, when I say local, that means like a property. So if I say, you know, my button, MX button, um, color equals, that will override anything up the chain. And then finally, when you call it an action script, the set style will always override this. Uh, well, I say always, but it depends on when you call set style, but it will override those properties. So keep that in mind is that when you want to determine who's going to win in that situation, if you have conflicting styles, this is the order of operation that actually is important to link together because that, that's how the, the cascading works within the application. Okay, so now we've talked about CSS and how we actually, what it's actually doing, what it gives us in our applications. How can we actually leverage it when we're creating our own components? Um, how can we make sure that we take advantage of this? And so there's really three areas we really need to look at when we're actually talking about CSS in our applications. So the first thing is ActionScript methods. So we're actually going to go look and talk about all the different methods that we have available to us for the style engine inside ActionScript, how we take advantage of it, and how we actually can use this in our own components. We're going to look at metadata. Metadata is the driving factor that enables the compiler to understand MXML and say, oh, this is a property, uh, right, instead of a set style. This is how we do this is through metadata. We'll get deep into that, too. And we'll start talking about the new Flex4 skins, uh, FXG, and how we can apply those in our applications. So here's the Flex methodologies we have to us. So there's actually four methods we really need to worry about when we're actually thinking about styles. So the first one is set style. Set style is actually how we apply the style, right? So we, set, we pass in the style name and we pass in the style value. Now this is interesting because we're going to use this for like, let's say skin class. 
I can say a set style skin class, I can put in a class reference as my value. So it's not just numerical values, I can pass objects, I can pass classes, I can pass null to clear out styles. So it's a very uh, generic way of setting a style, any style on our application through this method. Now, once we have a style set, how do we know that style is applied? How do we know that value? Well, the, the reverse of that is get style. So I can call the get style me uh, method and pass in the name of the property that I want, and it will return the value to us. And so in this example, it's like, how do I know the color has been set? I can call it get style, and then our color gets returned back to us. So that, what happens is get style calls the style manager and says, hey, what style do I have? And then the style manager determines, okay, do I have any uh, global values? Do I have any class values? Do I have any type values? And it goes down the chain, figures out what your value is, and then returns it back to you. Now, there's a um, UI component is a low-level class that every single component in uh, the Flex SDK uses. It's the base class everything's based off of. It has a method called style change that we can override. So when we're writing our own components, we can actually override the style change method, and, and whenever a style changes using set style, it'll get passed in saying, hey, your style changed, and here's the, the style that changed, the name of the style. So then you could do things like, okay, cool, do I need to like, you know, update my, my component? Do I need to do any calculations? You can do a whole bunch of, uh, of processing and style change to determine what needs to happen. Then finally, we have the update display list. So style change is a way to know when a style change, and at that point we call this update display list as the method on UI component that we can override that allows us to actually apply our style. So an update display list, we would call get style to determine what's changed, and then we could redraw the component, we could relay out the component, we could do whatever we needed to do to the display in that method. And so by using these methods and using that, that order of operation, we have a much better control. So we're not, the problem is if we just always did all our logic and style change instead of update display list, style change can change hundreds of times, right? Because of cascading, because of a lot of other uh, causes in our, our application, it could be styles we don't even care about, right? It could be some other style we don't even need to worry about. And so we only want to note what changed and then wait for update display list to occur because that's the area that we go in and actually do our calculations. And so that helps the performance that we're not doing calculations there's no, that are unnecessary just because the style change methodology got called. So the next thing we need to talk about is metadata. So remember we go back to when I was talking about MXML properties, the compiler comp uh, shows them in MXML as a property, but really it's still a style. It's still going to call set style behind the scenes. Well, the way that we inform uh, Flash Builder and the compiler that, that MXML uh, it, that, that property is actually a style is we use metadata. So if you look at the bottom, I, I hope you guys can all see it, this is what metadata looks like. It's square bracket, the type of metadata is the property. So here I can come in here and define uh, that uh, the style's name is error color. I can define it the type, so it's going to expect a uint. I can say the format is a color, so it'll actually look to make sure that yes, it is a hashtag uh, hex value. And then I can say it doesn't inherit. So inherit is the defining, that, do my children get this style? If I say inherent to no, my children won't get it. If I say yes, they will get it. So it's a way of actually setting that up and actually defining this. So this actually goes into our action script. This is actually how it goes on top of our class and marks up our class that says, here's how all the styles are applied. Now, what I recommend you guys doing, if you want to see good examples of this, open up the Flex SDK and look at the styling engine. Look at how Adobe has used styling metadata to expose that because this is how we can inform the compiler that we can do it. Now, this doesn't mean without the metadata that we can't use styles. We can still use set style and it will still get applied, but what we can't do is we can't use it in MXML, right? Because this is the key thing for MXML, this piece of code to let MXML know that this is a style and how to treat this at compile time. So that's really important. So metadata is really critical in this experience. So, we also have, so we've been talking about CSS, right? We're, we've been really deep diving into CSS and styling. Well, there's also another way of actually making your applications look and feel different. And we, I mentioned that at the beginning, we have the concept of skins. So what we'll do is now we're gonna actually look at skins and how we can use skins to change the look of our application. So the, uh, the key thing here that we're gonna look at is that we're gonna actually going, um, start with what, what a skin is. So really what we're talking about here is that the skin, the skin as I mentioned earlier, is the separation between the layout and the logic. Really, our components are no, no longer responsible for drawing to the stage. They're no longer responsible for going and calling 
get style and figuring out how it looks. That's no longer the responsibility of the component. The skin now needs to do that. So that's how you start, I need to start thinking about that, is that in my skin, a skin is a group, a group is a UI component. It also has the ability to call style changed. It also has the ability to get update display list. So it's now our skin's responsibility to say, what style has applied to me? What do I have to do? How do I pull that in? And so that's something that we need to really look at, is that now it's the skin's responsibility to define what it looks like. So how do we define a skin? We create a skin in MXML, we lay it all out, we, we, we can create our children, we can create our parent structure, we can create our transitions, we can take advantage of states in MXML and all that. And then what we do is we say, on the component, we set the skin class to a class reference to our MXML file. So example, I have like com.example.package.skin.skin file. When I call skin class reference in my CSS, I'm saying set, set, the, uh, set style skin class and pass in this style, and which is this, the, uh, the MXML file. And at that point, our component will use that to render its content on stage. So it says, hey, skin, you're, it's your responsibility to show what it looks like and behaves like on the screen. Uh, and that's the cool thing, because it is CSS, we can change that at any time. So if you recall, that now we can say, it's just like color. I can say set style skin class and change my skin at any time. So I could have multiple skins for the same component and then change them using CSS at any point to change how that looks. So that's kind of the basics behind skins, is that the whole idea is that you're not using CSS other than linking your skin class. You're really using skins to lay out the look and feel of your component. And if you want to change the look and feel of your component, you then just change skins, right? So the idea is you just change the skin. But that's not exactly always the most efficient thing you want to do. You know, there, you, know you want to be able to you know, change the background color. Well, if I, why would I want to create a whole new skin just to change the background color of this component? It doesn't make sense. It's just too much work, too much code, too much replication. So what we can do is we can actually use CSS to change those properties. And so what we can do in our skin, we can override update display list. And at that point, in update display list, we can call get style to get our values. And then we can use that value and then apply that to our skin's children. So that what happens is, I, let's say I have a background that's being drawn on stage. I can say, when the update display list changes, that means that I've changed state. So I've gone from up to over. Um, something else has occurred. Maybe I've changed the whole theme. I can then go and say, OK, cool. Get me the new color, return the color, change the background. And that way, I don't have to change skins, right? It's a way to actually managing and supporting CSS in my own component. Um, the key thing here, though, is to make sure that your style metadata is set on the component not the skin. So this is something that's uh, it's a little confusing in the beginning is you think, well, the skin's responsible for doing all my styling. The skin's responsible for displaying this, but why do I need to you know, set that on and the metadata, not on the skin? Well, the reality is because the skin can change at any time, those styles need to be shared across all the skins. So we put this on the component. So the metadata is always on the component. It's always on the action script, not our skin. So it's something to keep in the mind when you're actually creating CSS inside your skins. So the next thing we can talk about is actually skin states and CSS. So states, who are, is, are you guys understand when I describe states over, up, down, disabled? Does that make sense? Is that clear? Nod your head, yes, yeah, cool, thumbs up, thumbs down. OK, good, good, OK. Um, so we want to know. If I, because we're creating a skin, we have to understand those states. Right? If I'm creating a button skin, I need to know uh, when my button's going from up to over to down so I can change the look, right? So let's say my, I need to actually, uh, I want to fade my background from red to blue when the user rolls over, right? I need to know when that transition occurs. I need to know when that, the user's interacted with that. So what we can do is beca because we have this concept of pseudo selectors, remember pseudo selectors is the ability to use colon in the state name and I can change properties. It's up to our skin to make sure it knows that, hey, I've gone from up to over, so I need to actually get the new value because I need to understand what the new color is going to be. And so what happens is we can actually take advantage of that, um, that automatically. So what's cool about the way Flex works is I can create a custom skin with custom states and then define them using my syntax, the colon up syntax. And any time that state changes, it'll automatically call update display list for me. And so I can just say, hey, what's my new color? Right? So that's my point in my code, is I can override update display list 
listen for the change. I get the change and determine, ah, oh, this is what color needs to change, and then I can affect the background at that point, or I can affect whatever it needs to do. So it's, it's really nice that pseudo selectors automatically are supported in skins, and they automatically call update display list, so we can take advantage of that in our applications. There's also a, some new functionality that we're rolling or they're introducing into Flex 4. It's this new concept of FXG. Um, is anyone familiar with SVG? Yeah, SVG. Okay, it's for HTML. What it is a, a way of one of the, the challenges of drawing content is how do you draw it, right? How do I actually draw this content on stage? Well, originally in, in Flash, you can still do this today. You guys use the drawing API, right? So you're doing things like you know begin fill, end fill. You're saying move move your pointer to this position, draw a circle. Here's how big it should be. And it takes a lot of thought, right? You have to actually think in the order of, okay, I need to move my cursor here, I need to draw it this big, I need to fill it with this color, I need to set the stroke. And it, it really, to create really complex objects, takes a lot of code and a lot of thought that you need to consider while doing this. So what FXG is doing for us is allow us to use MXML to actually do that layout for us. So we can create really, really complex graphics using MXML. So here's a really, really simple example, is that I am drawing a rectangle, I'm setting its top, left, right, and bottom to zero. So that means that as my component scales, my rect will grow with it. So it's pretty much setting the width and height to 100%, right? And then I'm saying give it a fill of solid color with an ID of BG color, and then give it a value, right? So I could set, actually I could use gradient, I could use, I could define another property for stroke, I could apply shadows. All that is supported inside this FXG syntax. And what's really nice about this is it's pretty readable. You can actually read this code and pretty much get a feel for what it's doing. It also ena enables tools like Flash Catalyst and Adobe Illustrator and uh, Fireworks to actually read FXG and understand what it's trying to draw on the screen. It's vector graphics, what am I trying to represent? And this gets compiled down pretty much by the compiler for us into the ActionScript API that actually does the drawing for us. So it's just an easy way of doing this. Now what's cool about FXG is because it's in M MXML, we can do things like Seth style, so I can actually reference, because I've given solid color an ID, I can say, hey, background color in my update display list on my skin, change your color to my style. So you can see now how I can start linking and styling with CSS using FXG, because I can modify anything in FXG at any time. I can change the, the, by the ID, I can change the color, I could change the fill, I could pop this out, I could move it, I could change the ratio of sizing, all through CSS styles. So all of a sudden now we're able to really dramatically change the look and feel of our application using CSS. And so this is how all the styling is done in the new Spark skins. So if you actually open up the Flex SDK and look at how Adobe created the skin for the combo box, how they're creating the skin for the button, how they're creating the skin for the list, they're using FXG and CSS to support those properties. And so this is a, a, a way they're actually doing this to actually create the flexibility, create themes within our application. And so that's something that's really powerful that we can take advantage of inside. Now, I, I do want to have a couple caveats I want to talk about with FXG. FXG is vector, right? That means that the Flash player has to interpret this code, has to relay it out, and actually programmatically draw it to the screen. That does two things for us. One, it takes uh, memory and it takes processing time because every time I resize my app, every time I change state, every time I interact with it, it has to redraw on the screen. So that creates a lot of problems um, when you start talking about really complex graphics. Like, so let's say I have a really nice complex icon and I'm using FXG, it's going to be hundreds of lines of FXG, right? And that has to be redrawn by the Flash player every time the update display stack changes. That's not efficient, right? So what we found, and we've been doing a development arc, we've been doing a lot of testing into this uh, FXG. What we found is, unless you're, you're doing things like this, unless you're dynamically changing your FXG on the fly, unless you're really using the FXG to do scale, high fidelity scaling to actually do uh, dramatic changes of the FXG in runtime, PNG and other raster based graphics are significantly better. We found that a PNG icon of like 30 by 30 pixels is about 15K, let's say. Maybe it's you know, 10K or 30K depending on how complex it is. The same thing in FXG is something like 100K. It's actually significantly bigger and which is funny because the whole idea of going vector is to try to make it smaller, but because there's so much layout information that has to go in there, FXG is significantly bigger than raster graphics. On top of that, the Flash player still has to process it, where if it was just a PNG, it gets put onto the display stack and shown and rendered to screen. 
So what we're recommending that you do is FXG is really nice. It has a lot of power, but only use it when you're actually needing really high fidelity scaling or when you're actually doing dynamic styling like we're showing here and to kind of use it sparsely. Um, to give you an example, um, I'm one of the developers behind Adobe's Workflow Lab. And the whole point of Workflow Lab was to build an Air app all in Flex 4 at, at the release of Mac. So at the first Mac, so they were introduced Flex 4, this is going to be the showpiece they wanted to show. So we used FXG in everything. Every single icon, everything you saw on stage was all FXG. And the performance wasn't very good. It was OK, but it wasn't great. By just changing everything over to raster graphics, we saw a significant performance increase in startup time. So it's something to keep in mind. There's a lot of flexibility, a lot of power through CSS and FXG, but it's very, very heavy. So kind of to wrap it up, Flex4 is giving us a lot, a lot of opportunities, right? We have everything from the ability to create new skinning and skin files. We can use all this new CSS syntax. Um, it's giving us a lot of different ways we can approach our product, how we can actually define and design our application. And then it can also um, makes it much more powerful. But there's some challenges too, right? The challenge is that we're not 100% there yet with CSS and our components. There's a lot of CSS that we're used to in Flex3 that we don't actually have available to us. Flex 4.5, what's coming up very soon, is adding a lot more. They're rolling them back in. But there's still a lot of challenges that we have because we, we can't take advantage of the CSS. So if you guys are using Flex3 and you want to bring an existing product over to Flex4, be prepared to have to do a lot of skinning. Be prepared to have to do a lot of modification, especially if you're using a lot of CSS to style your application because a lot of that is, is not there right now. Um, other thing to think about is we're noticing that yeah, styling is really powerful. It's really flexible, but it's also it does have some performance impact because Remember, we have to think about the, all the cascading, all the different selectors, all the priority that we have to uh, call. So the style manager has to process all that. So every time we call, you use set style, there's inherent weight into that. We have to actually think about what does that entail, what has to, all the logic that has to get processed. So it's something you don't want to keep calling set style all the time. You have to intelligently think about when do you use set style to actually set and change that. Get style is much faster, so you can actually get call get style and, and it's a much lighter call. But it's something you actually need to think about when you're actually using CSS. So it's something that's it's really powerful, it's really flexible, but we have to, you have to take it with a grain of salt because the situation is that it is adding a lot of functionality and a lot of logic that you, don't have, you have to consider when actually building your application. And then, but finally, you can take advantage of it. It is, you know, it is very, very flexible. Um, you know, some examples of where you'd want to use it is let's say you're building a, a component set that you're going to be using on multiple projects. Right? Or you know that the UI is going to be changing all the time, so it's important to actually support CSS. So it's something that in some situations it's going to be faster and easier just to make a skin and not worry about styling. But in other situations, if you're going to need it to be highly stylable, you're going to use this over and over again on multiple projects, or you're going to have uh, other users or other clients are using it, CSS is really, really important. So keep that in mind uh, when developing it. So I want to you know, thank you and questions. And you want me to focus on anything? Bom, é, primeiro, eu gost, gostei muito da, da palestra. Seguinte, é, é um problema que eu estou tendo em uma aplicação que ela precisa ser lida por um leitor de telas que é desenvolvido para deficientes visuais. E com, com todos os componentes que eu estou utilizando skins, o, o leitor identifica o tipo do componente. Se é botão, se é um item de lista, tudo bem. Mas... No, no text input, ele identifica como elemento gráfico. Isso, isso atrapalha muito para o deficiente visual, porque aquilo é um campo que precisa ter um valor digitado. E se ele não identifica como um campo texto, e nem eu tenho como mudar isso, a não ser que eu mude o accessibility name, mas aí eu utilizo para dizer o que realmente é o campo, isso atrapalha todo o meu projeto, porque ele precisa ser visto, visto de certa forma, por um cego, entendeu? Eu queria saber se você pode me dar alguma dica sobre como resolver esse problema. That's a really good question. I think that one of the, the challenges with with Adobe and Flex is accessibility. I think they're they're getting better about helping the disabled um, and screen readers to actually interact with the application. But this is a big challenge. Um, 
and I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest, I don't know exactly how the new accessibility is working with skins. I think that, uh, unfortunately, I've met a lot of people like you who are actually taking the time to work and create applications for the disabled, yet there's very little documentation. And unfortunately, I've had to do very little work with you know, creating accessibility. And I know that there are some hooks in there, but that's a really good question. So what I recommend, you know, come talk to me afterwards. I'll give you my information. We'll talk to, so I know some people at Adobe who focus in this. And I'll get you in touch with them. Uh, we'll talk with John Koch and some other people, and, and we'll try to get that answer. Because that, that is a very common issue and something that I, I, you know, Adobe doesn't do as good as a job as I'd like uh, in some ways. They, in some ways, they've been very proactive, but there's a, I have a feeling there's a lot of documentation and issues where accessibility kind of comes second, um, when I'd like to see more of it. And so let's, let's talk about this afterwards. Is there another mic I can pass around? So, oh, should go, cool. Hi, James. How are you? How's it going? Uh, about Flash Catalyst, do you, uh, do you have used it in your, in your projects? One more time, sorry. Say it again. About the Flash Catalyst. Yes. Do you, do you have used it for your projects? Yes. So you know, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about that. So we were some of the first people to use Catalyst uh, for the, that project workflow lab that I was telling you about. Um, one of the other things, that, so it was actually brought to a, the project brought to us by Doug Winnie. Doug Winnie at that time was the product manager of Flash Catalyst. And the idea is, let's experiment with Catalyst, let's experiment with Flex 4, let's try this workflow out and to see how it worked. So the original version of Flash Catalyst, the one that's out today, 1.0, um, is a neat toy, but it's not really great for de uh, development workflow yet. And Adobe knows that. And that's something that they were, you know, it's a 1.0 product. They're trying to come out and, and demonstrate some possibilities. We did use it, and we did find some workflows for it. They weren't elegant. They weren't perfect. But what we did is our designer did all their artwork in Illustrator. Um, and so he was, he's this brilliant designer named Chris Stone out of Vancouver. And he sat and did all the design in Illustrator. He then gave us the Illustrator files. And then what we did in Illustrator is we brought that uh, Illustrator file into Flash Catalyst. We opened up in Fa Flash Catalyst, converted to components, and then actually went to Code View and just cut and paste and then moved that into uh, Flash Builder. So pretty much it was a skinning tool in the sense that it helped generate the, the MXML for us, right? And so remember I was saying that we used FXG for everything. That's kind of why. Everything was done in Illustrator. We brought in a Catalyst. Everything that came out of Catalyst was FXG, and then we bring it into the application. Um, now, the new version that we're coming out with they're introducing uh, round tripping. They're actually introducing some really neat features that have the ability to share projects and libraries from Flash Builder to Flash Catalyst. And so now we have the ability to say Illustrator to Catalyst to Flash Builder, back to Catalyst, back to Flash Builder, and kind of round tripping. Now, it's a 2.0 or a 1. Dot, I don't I forgot what the numbering scheme is going to be. It's not going to be perfect yet, right? I mean, it's, it's not going to be able to support third party libraries. They're, they are going to be requiring very consistent like um, standards about how these files work so that they interplay. Because I mean, let's be honest, that's a really tough thing to do, right? You might be a Mate user, I might be a Karangorm user, we might have a Robot Legs user, we could have a PRMVC user. How can you support all those different libraries, how they talk to components, and make Catalyst understand that? So there's, still, there's gonna be limitations, but it's getting better. They are pushing it, and they're understanding too about the creating better animations, transitions, and so it is becoming a really powerful tool. So it's, it's exciting. And I think it's going to be getting into more people's workflows, but we're going to still have to kind of bend our workflow to the tools versus the tools bending to our workflow. Okay? Welcome. Any other questions? Yeah? Eric? Hey. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, it was good, good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I want to know um, if the problems with this, with the Flash uh, player uh, in li like CSS rendering. I, I remember when, when I worked with Flash uh, authoring tool, mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, problems uh, doing padding, uh, uh, inserting paddings, uh, aligning text, for example. 
Uh, these problems uh, still in, in flex uh, styles? Um, not as much. I think they've done a much better job of supporting the padding, the text alignment. There, I mean, that's something, one of the things that Flex4 has done, they moved over to the new TLF. So it's a new text layout framework. So it's creating a much more robust text engine that gives us a lot more control over kerning, alignment, padding, text, and, and positioning. So the CSS is hooking into that. And so it is creating a much better and easier functionality. Is it perfect? Not quite. You, you'll still have to tweak it. It's not going to be consistent across. But overall, I think that it's been pretty, pretty easy. And it does you know, almost everything that we want. In fact, I do a lot of that with now with our, our laying out text, using the padding, using the alignment. And it does 9 out of 10 times exactly what I want. And then every once in a while, it's like, ah, I need to pad it just a little bit more, pad it a little bit less. Um, but it's pretty, it's, I have to get, I mean, it's, there's been a lot of thought into what the uh, Flex team is doing to make the styling support inside uh, Flex work well. Um, where I, felt, I feel Flash Professional, where well, they were kind of adding it on, and it was like, you know, they're trying to tie it in, and they're getting better too, but I think really Flex really thought a lot of that through. So it's, it's, it's pretty solid. Great. Right. É, em primeiro lugar, parabéns pra, pela apresentação. E eu, na verdade, tenho um comentário a fazer assim, em relação à questão da acessibilidade mesmo. É, eu sinto que, em relação ao flex, ao flash, ainda há essa pendência para ser resolvida, né? porque essa questão de deficientes visuais ou auditivos, é, eu acho que ainda é um caminho que a Domenda deveria perseguir né? e, e continuar produzindo algo que fosse mais interessante para essa área. Mas, além dessa, desse comentário que eu queria fazer, eu queria te perguntar também se tu teria algum exemplo para mostrar de como funciona isso assim na tua máquina, enfim, se tu tivesse aí, pudesse mostrar para a gente alguma coisa em relação a isso. Sure, let me, uh, let me fire something up. Okay, so we're gonna do, totally do some coding on the fly. This should be fun. Uh, not prepared for this, but that's good. No, fine. Okay, so do you want me to show you, like, maybe start with the skin and some CSS? Is that what you like to see first? Okay. We'll go with that. My poor slow computer tries to chug through this. There you go. Really quick, let me show you what you have available to you. Um,
So you'll, you'll actually, you'll notice there's three skins because we actually, they've created Spark skins for MXML too. So you can actually apply Spark skins to the old button set. So to keep that in mind, you can actually, once you start understanding skinning, apply that. But you also have to understand the inherent weight of skins. Remember, you're now having two components. You're having an MXML file and you're having the component put together. So it does add some weight. But you can see here what Adobe's done is we have um, the, let's see, where is it? Up here, here's an example of overriding the update display list. So what they're doing here is they're actually saying, okay, get style corner radius. And they're actually saying, do I have a, the corner radius? The corner radius is a component of XG, so like we'll come down here and um, there's, the, there's the value that they actually update. And that is by, um, defined so they actually can set the value. Um, and then you can see here they actually start interacting with the shadow. The shadow is using a rec. So there's our FX, FXG examples. They're actually using the shadow and manipulating it. So here's a, so you can actually, that's when I say you go through the SDK code. Here's a really good example to actually see this. So this is like, you know, how Adobe's doing it. So let me actually show you like a basic example of how, you know, I want to create a custom skin. Now it has an option to actually create the copy, so this would actually copy the Adobe skin for me. I don't want to do that because there's too much code, I don't want to see all that, so I'm going to uncheck that. So you can see here by default, this skin has our, uh, some metadata that, that was called a host component. That says, what is this skin designed for? So it's designed for a button. And so that tells the compiler and the tool that actually gives us hints such as what states are required because I need to make sure that my, my skin supports the states the button ex expects, right? So if, let's say the button, I didn't actually have like the down state and the button goes into a down state, how do I behave? The skin doesn't know how to behave. So we'll actually get a compiler error saying, hey, you haven't supported all the required states. So that's what that functionality is doing there. So we, it def defaults our states there and then it tells us that we have one skin part. So remember, parts are the children of, this, of our skin. So in this example, it's saying I have a label display, right? That's a text base, and the goal of that is to show the actual text on my button. So that's optional. I, my button doesn't have to have a label. It's up to me to implement that in the skin or not. Right, so there I'm calling, using a little FXG to call, I'm creating the background. This is the background of my skin for the button. And I'm going to cheat and go copy the label field from the button skin. Okay, so now I have my label display. Now the key thing here is that remember it, it said that one of my parts required label to say, it's by the ID. Your ID has to match. That's how it actually, your skins get bound to the parts. So pretty much what's happening is when your skin gets attached to your button, this, the button, uh, the component says, hey skin, do you have a component ID named label display? Oh, you do, cool, that's a part. That's how you link it together. So that ID is how you actually do all the linking. So if, if this is a you know, pretty ugly skin. It doesn't actually do anything, so I can come and link this in. So here's how we're actually attaching our skin. Because I'm using a button, I want to actually attach the skin to it. So I'll actually come to the skin class and I come and say, my button skin, and I'll actually link it in there for me. And at this point, I've actually now put my button and put the skin on there. So it's going to be like just a pretty much a blue box with a little label, right? So if I run this. Oh, 
I see our red. So I can't even really see it. Let me do a little padding. Hold on. Yeah. So, right. That's it. Really basic. So now I want to be able to come in here and change that color. So let's give that ID like I did in that example. I say ID a BG color. I can't hit that. And then up here I'm going to write a little action script. I'll just do it by hand. <laughs> okay, so what I'm doing here is, because my skin, remember, is a component, I can go write code to do update, override update display list. So anytime my component changes, update display list will get called. So now I can hook into it and actually do calculations in here. So at this point, what I can do is I can say uh, if BG color. So I want to make sure that you know, my component actually exists. I can come in here and say, OK, cool, um, BG color dot color is equal to get style. Right. So, well, actually, that's I want. We're going to create a new style. We're going to call this. Now, remember how I mentioned you need metadata for MXML, but I can, you can still use styles. So, what we're doing here is I'm going to create a custom style called background color, and because I'm using ActionScript to pull it out, it's still going to be available to me. It's just not. I can't just cheat. I can't use it as MXML properties. I can't go over here and define background style. I can't do this. Because there's no, it doesn't expose it through the metadata, but I can still call, I can still set that. So I can come in here, and I'll come in and create a CSS. We'll do a little style block. And notice again how the namespaces get automatically created for me, which is really nice. And I come in here and I create a new style. So you know, my style. And. And I can set it to, uh, let's go blue. All right. And then I can come down here and apply that using style name. Oh, it's not going to hit that, my style. So now, if everything goes right, when I refresh, well, it didn't go right. Yeah, this is what happens when you do live coding, right, with no planning. Oh, let me do this to you. Sometimes the order of when updates the playlist is important too. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So. The, that was the order operation. So now we can change that. So now we can come in here and start doing things in our CSS, right? I can start doing things like pseudo selectors. So I can say, uh, oops, uh, why are you doing that? On up, I want it to be green. But then I come to here, and I can say on over, I can make it blue. So there's green, over blue. So this is how we actually start tying all those things in. So that's, that's kind of the general idea of how we can actually start doing styling, using skins, uh, even using CSS, uh, using those methods in an update display list. A gente tem mais cinco minutos para perguntas. Quatro minutos, na verdade. Quem quer perguntar alguma coisa? O Odair queria perguntar alguma coisa? Bom, 
eu, que, eu queria saber o que é que consome mais recursos da máquina. Se é utilizar é, dim, é, dimensões em percentual ou com top, left, constraint. That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I've, I've seen, the problem is there's no consistency even in the Flex SDK. They tend to, in the SDK, go with top, bottom, left, and right. Um, I have a feeling, my gut says top, left, bottom, right is a little bit more performant, but I actually, actually haven't tested it. So I can't definitively say this is faster or not. I, I have a feeling top, the top, bottom, left, and right is going to be a little bit more efficient because the percentage it has to recalculate the percentage and then ratio versus top, it's always zero, 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 zero. There's no calculation, it just knows, put this you know, position here. So it's probably a little less calculative, intensive to do that. Um, but I haven't tested it, so I don't know for sure. But my gut would probably say top, bottom, left, and right is faster. I just didn't do it there because it takes longer to type. Mais alguma pergunta? Então é isso. Thank you, James. Muito obrigado.